Section 1 of the Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lori Banza. The Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest by Dr. Merrill Pingree Freeman. Introduction through Paris Adopts Name of Apache A short time ago, idling through a collection of early day photographs, I came across two that vividly recalled the closing scenes in that bloody frontier drama in which the Apache was the chief actor. For many years the relentless foe of the pioneer, wary, tireless, cowardly, and treacherous, he was the very incarnation of fiendishness, if possible, more pronounced in the squaw than in the man. Never meeting you in the open, always in ambush, concealed behind the big granite boulder, the point of a hill or a clump of brush, he and his fellows patiently awaited your solitary coming, all unconscious of danger. Then, the crack of the rifle, and it is all over. Today he might be a sniper, but in the days of his hellish activities the word had not yet been given its more recently enlarged meaning. Two thousand pioneers, victims of Apaches. How many breakers of the wilderness, hardy, fearless old-timers, were sent to their final rest by this early scourge of the desert? Who can say? Some place their number at two thousand some say more others less this does not include the soldier boy whose profession it is to risk his life and when necessary his duty its sacrifice of the number of these there is probably a record somewhere but of the old pioneer only an estimate in the valley on the mesa and the hillside on the mountain top and in the deep shadows of the canyon Everywhere this broad land is dotted with their unknown and unmarked graves. Captain John G. Bork, author of The Border with Crook and an Apache Campaign, who was with General Crook, tells us that the Apache is no coward, but that he has no false ideas about courage, that he would prefer to skulk like a coyote for hours and then kill his enemy rather than by injudicious exposure receive a wound. May we not attribute to the chivalrous spirit of Captain Bork not to criticize a foe, his delicate way of putting this? No, I do not recall that this early plague of the old pioneer ever injudiciously exposed himself unless driven to it. Skulking like the coyote, as Captain Bork so well expresses it, is my conception of his bravery if forced to the open he would undoubtedly make a brave fight but i have never heard of his voluntarily seeking that open meeting his enemy on anything approaching equal terms paris adopts name of apache being over in paris a few years ago a friend who had lived there a number of years and who was as familiar with paris from basement to roof garden as i am with congress street of our good old town of tucson suggested one evening that we visit the apaches expressing surprise that any of my people should have wandered so far from home i suggested as a substitute the moulin rouge however the apaches were agreed upon and in the evening my friend bringing a policeman with him called for me at my hotel arriving at the door of the apache rendezvous in due course we three my friend the policeman and myself are readily admitted the presence of our policeman assuring that and we find ourselves in an underground dive a large room with a low ceiling barely furnished dimly lighted and reeking with the sour odor of stale beer looking about the room by the dim light as it forces its way through the dense gloom of tobacco smoke we are enabled to see two other policemen besides our own there are two stationed there day and night and a score or more of the toughest looking lot of cutthroats i have ever had the pleasure of coming in contact with this was the retreat 
the gathering place of as bad a lot of thieves thugs robbers burglars and murderers as the world could boast of and paris in seeking a name for them that would embody all of these characteristics had searched the world over and was almost in despair of finding a single word that would express all that is mean wantingly cruel murderous and cowardly but at last attention was directed to the apache of arizona and then it was discovered that the word which would embody all that and more had been found and that was why i was enabled to find some of my own home people away off there in the world's centre of fashion settling for a few bottles of the vilest beer possible to brew as a tip to the house i was soon ready to ask my friend to call his policeman and get us away from this vile den end of section one section two of the dread apache the early day scourge of the southwest by dr merle pingree freeman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain judge mccomas and wife murdered through little boy taken from gaslow ranch it is scarcely more than a quarter of a century march eighteen eighty three since judge mccomas his wife and their little son charlie about seven years of age coming from silver city new mexico to lordsburg were ambushed by a band of apaches from san carlos the judge and his wife killed and poor little charlie carried off to the sierra madres in mexico where a few years later an apache squaw reported that on their camp being attacked by united states troops charlie being frightened ran off into the mountains where he is supposed to have died of hunger and exposure on july third eighteen eighty five frank peterson who was carrying the united states mail between crittenden and lochiel was killed by the indians while returning from lochiel to crittenden a sad feature in connection with this killing was that he had just been married dr davis shot to death on june third eighteen eighty six dr c h davis a brother of w c davis of tucson coming from the san pedro river over the pass between the catalinas and the rincons with a wagon and span of mules was waylaid and killed by a band of these outlaws j p hohusen and w h wheaton coming from their homes on the san pedro the day before met dr davis going out and warned him against the indians but having been in the country but a short time he failed to appreciate the danger and made light of the warning it was subsequently learned that hohussen and wheaton narrowly escaped the same band themselves as they were coming into tucson when hohussen returned home he learned from his man that the indians had been at his place the night before the killing of davis and attempted to drive off some of his horses from the pasture but the man seizing his rifle jumped into a well which was partly caved in and which naturally furnished him an excellent defensive position and from this he fired at the indians but without apparent effect other than to force them to leave the place after the killing of dr davis the indians taking the two mules went to walter vale's happy valley ranch in the rincons where they left the mules in exchange for a bunch of vale's horses shooting but not killing cal matthews the herder from happy valley they passed south into the whetstones where they shot and killed marcus goldbaum edward l vale one of the party going out to the scene of the killing found that the indians had been gone but a few hours having also killed a partner of goldbaum as he was en route to benson little boy taken from gastello ranch it was not long prior to this that a band working from the sierra madres to the san carlos reservation attacked the ranch of juan gastello not over fifteen miles from tucson near tank verde 
and carried off with them a little Mexican boy. The news coming to town, a volunteer company, was immediately formed by M. G. Samanego, now dead, and R. N. Leatherwood, R. Bob. Samanego, having had a brother killed by the Apaches a few years before, was more than keen for an opportunity to avenge his death. The volunteer company, led by Leatherwood and Samanego, came upon the band and camped in the neighborhood of Tang Verde. The Indians, however, being alarmed by the premature firing of a gun, scattered like a flock of quail and got away. But the boy, escaping, was recovered by the volunteers. On another occasion, a band, killing a rancher named Lloyd, four miles north of Pantano, stole the horses of Ed Vale and George Schofield near Rosemont, and passing on south, killed a man named Wimple near Greaterville. End of section 2「Section 3 of the Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest » by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mexicans Attack and Rob Wheaton through Tommy Gates Displays Magnificent Nerve. A trying experience in the life of Wheaton who narrowly escaped the band that killed Dr. Davis, was when four Mexicans came to his ranch on the San Pedro River one evening, he being entirely alone at the time, and demanded his money, which they said they knew him to have from the sale of some hogs. He, however, denying that he had any money, they proceeded to put a rope round his neck, and strung him up three or four times, each time demanding that he tell where the money was concealed, and he still denying that he had any. During all this time they were trying to find where the money was hidden, and finally discovered it, about sixty dollars, in the window casing. Then the question was debated as to what they should do with Wheaton, whether or not they should kill him. This they evidently hesitated to do, but finally decided to take him out and throw him into his well, probably having in mind that this would not kill him, but would make him a close prisoner for a time. On taking him to the well, however, they found it to be a bored one, and therefore only eight or ten inches in diameter. Of course this frustrated that plan, and they returned him to the house, and throwing him on his bed proceeded to tie him, and after threatening to kill him in case he at any time made them any trouble over the affair, they left him. As soon as they were gone, Wheaton succeeded in releasing himself and went to the home of J.P. Hohassen, not far away, naturally nearly prostrated from his fright and the terrible ordeal through which he had just passed. The next day, Wheaton, accompanied by Ira Davis, a brother of Dr. Davis, came to Tucson and reported the case to Judge C. H. Meyer, an old-time justice of the peace. Old Charlie Meyer, Law Unto Himself Old Charlie Meyer, as he was familiarly called, was indeed a character, and had the well-earned reputation of meeting out justice with an iron hand, and, due in a large measure to his eccentric methods of administering justice, was quite popular with the well-meaning, but certainly a terror to the evildoer. Judge Meyer's conception of justice and the language of the statutes frequently failed to be in full harmony. But that, of course, was not a matter for which he was responsible, and should not, and did not, interfere in the slightest degree with the administration of justice in his court. Meyer recalled that four Mexicans had that same day come into his court, and, by the deposit of sixty dollars as bail, had secured the release of their friend, one L. Zora, who was being held for some offense, having been unable until then to secure bail. Three of these four men were immediately found and arrested. The fourth, having started for Mexico, was followed by the officers and overtaken at Bowley's Well, where, in resisting arrest, he was shot and killed by Bob Cannon, one of the officers. 
on trial of the other three, Hohessen was able to fully identify one of the bills in the $60 turned in to Judge Meyer's court as one that he had personally paid to Wheaton a few days before. In addition to this, one of the men, Pancho Gomez, having turned state's evidence, they were all three convicted and sentenced to the territorial prison, Gomez, however for a shorter term than the others. Tommy Gates displays magnificent nerve. While serving their terms on October 27, 1887, in an attempted outbreak at the prison in which these men participated, the prisoners succeeded in getting hold of the superintendent of the prison, Thomas Gates, familiarly known as Tommy Gates, and threatened to take his life if he permitted the guards to fire on them. Notwithstanding this, he ordered the guards to fire when one of the Wheaton convicts, one Puebla, thrust a knife first into his shoulder and then into his back, seriously but not fatally wounding him. Barney Riggs, a life-termer, then succeeded in getting hold of a pistol, shot and killed Puebla, and for this was subsequently pardoned out in response to the almost unanimous sentiment of the territory. In the Amuet, four of the prisoners were killed outright, and Tommy Gates' display of nerve on the occasion goes into history as a heroic example of self-sacrifice in the discharge of duty. End of section 3 Section 4 of The Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest, by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Brutal Murder of Mrs. Peck and Baby Through Little Phil Saves Mother and Sisters Brutal Murder of Mrs. Peck and Baby On April 27, 1886, a band of Indians appeared at the ranch of A. L. Peck, about twenty miles from Oro Blanco, where they found Mrs. Peck, her baby, about eleven months old, and her niece, Jenny, a young girl of about eleven years. Killing Mrs. Peck and the baby, they took the young girl away with them. It was asserted by some at the time, including Peck himself, that the leader of this band was Geronimo, but I think this could hardly have been possible, for the reason that the leader was too young and spoke good English, whereas Geronimo did not speak English. In giving the story of his life to S. M. Barrett at Fort Sill, not many years ago it had to be done through an interpreter. Besides, Geronimo had escaped from General Crook, sixty-five miles south of Fort Bowie and one hundred twenty-five miles east of Oro Blanco, on the night of March twenty-ninth, only a month previous, and gone into the Sierra Madre Mountains. It is my opinion that Geronimo was never seen in Arizona subsequent to that time, until he surrendered to General Miles and was brought to Fort Bowie the following September. At the time of the killing of Mrs. Peck, Peck and a young man by the name of Charles Owen were a mile or two away from the house, both being mounted but unarmed, and were in the act of catching a steer. The Indians surprising them, Peck's horse was shot from under him, and he was captured and held prisoner. Owen, being well mounted, made a dash for his life but ran into another part of the same band. His horse was shot from under him, and Owen himself was shot through the neck and arm, killing him instantly. Those that had Peck were apparently waiting for their leader for instructions as to what to do with him. The leader soon coming up, after taking from Peck his boots, knife, and tobacco, they released him, telling him, however, not to go home. Before releasing him, one of the Indians, for some unexplainable reason, gave him sixty-five cents in money. A squaw with this band had little Jenny on a horse with her. Jenny was crying bitterly, 
and when Peck attempted to talk with her, the Indians intervened and prevented his doing so. About six weeks later, she was rescued from the Indians by some Mexican cowboys at a point about 40 miles from Magdalena, Sonora, where she was delivered to Peck, who had gone after her. As soon as released, Peck went directly home, where he found his wife and baby lying dead. Shanahan killed Yank Bartlett wounded. The day following the killing of Mrs. Peck and her baby, John Shanahan, who was unarmed, left Yank Bartlett's ranch in Bear Valley, about eight miles from Oro Blanco, for his own place, about three miles distant, leaving at the ranch with Bartlett his little son, Phil, about ten years of age, who was there visiting Johnny Bartlett of about the same age. Shanahan had been gone but about ten minutes when Johnny ran into the room where his father was, telling him that he had just heard three shots and that he thought maybe the Indians had shot the old man. Bartlett, who had not heard of Indians being in the vicinity, scouted the idea, but on going outside saw Shanahan approaching and ran to him and assisted him into the house, Shanahan telling him that the Indians had shot him. Bartlett immediately seized his gun, and on going to the door, a bullet fired by one of the Indians whistled past his head. There were but three of the Indians, but having placed themselves in different positions, it was hardly possible for Bartlett to get a shot at them without exposing himself to their fire, and one shot from then passing through his shoulder only missed the head of Johnny by about an inch blinding him from the dust of the adobe wall as the bullet struck it. The fight between Bartlett and the three Indians was kept up until dark. Shanahan, fatally wounded, was constantly calling out for water. Bartlett thinks that in the fight he wounded one of the Indians. Little Phil Saves Mother and Sisters Shanahan's story is that a short time after leaving the house, being totally unconscious of any danger, he was suddenly shot by an Indian, whom he then saw only about thirty feet away. Picking up a rock and starting for the Indian, Shanahan received another shot from behind that knocked him down, but he was immediately up again and ran back for the house, Bartlett meeting and assisting him in. Shanahan saw but two Indians and said he could have killed both, if he had had, had a gun. During the time, Bartlett was keeping the Indians at bay, realizing the danger of Mrs. Shanahan and her two young daughters at their home three miles away. He told Phil, Shanahan's little son, to steal out of the house by a back way and go to his home and notify his mother of their danger and of the shooting of his father. Phil, demurred at first, wanting to stay with his father, who was suffering intensely, but being told that unless he went, his mother and little sisters would surely be killed, the little fellow courageously said he would try to get to them, and good fortune favoring him, he succeeded in doing so. Finding them in the garden, they all, including Phil, immediately started for the mountains, where they concealed themselves until the following day. In the meantime, the Indians had come to the house and carried off or wrecked everything in it and would undoubtedly have killed Mrs. Shanahan and the two little girls had not brave little Phil, at the risk of his life, warned them of the danger. End of section 4section 5 of the dread apache that early day scourge of the southwest by dr merle pingree freeman this librivox recording is in the public domain brave little johnny bartlett through geronimo surrenders to general miles brave little johnny bartlett bartlett kept the indians off until dark when it is probable they left as they were not seen again. Soon after dark, Bartlett told Johnny that he must go to Oro Blanco and notify the people of the shooting of Shanahan and himself, 
and that Shanahan was probably dying. When little Johnny was told that he must do this, like the little hero he was, he simply said, All right, Papa, and immediately started, first taking off his shoes and going barefoot the first mile or two to avoid making any sound. Johnny, on foot, reached Oro Blanco, eight miles away, about two o'clock in the morning and gave the alarm. A posse was immediately made up and started for the scene of the troubles, where they found Shanahan dead and Bartlett wounded, and the Indians evidently gone. General Crook relieved. General George Crook came to Arizona in 1870, remaining in command of the department here until 1875, when he was transferred to the Department of the Platte and was reassigned and returned to Arizona in 1882. In 1886, evidently taking exception to an implied criticism from the department at Washington, and, as he expressed it, having spent nearly eight years of the hardest work of his life in this department, he asked to be relieved. Crook was criticized in Arizona at the time for a too abiding faith in the loyalty of his Indian scouts, and many of us believe this criticism to be fully justified. There is hardly a doubt that much of the ammunition used by the renegades was supplied them by these same scouts. It was but a few months prior to Crook's being relieved that Captain Crawford, a zealous and gallant officer, while engaged in his thankless task of ridding their country of these pests, was treacherously killed by Mexican irregular troops in the Sierra Madre Mountains. It is true that these irregular troops were Terra Humeri Indians, possibly as wild and uncontrollable as the Apaches themselves, and that they may extenuate the treachery to some extent, but the fact remains that the officers in command were not Indians, but Mexicans. Geronimo Surrenders to General Miles On April 2, 1886, General Miles, superseding Crook, took command of the Department of Arizona, and in his personal recollections he speaks of finding here, stationed at Fort Huachuca, a fair-haired, blue-eyed young man of great intellect, manly qualities, and resolute spirit, a splendid type of American manhood. This fair-haired, blue-eyed young man of 1886 was at the time assistant surgeon in the Army. He is now Major General Leonard Wood, late chief of staff, U.S. Army. On the 4th of September, following Miles' assuming command, Geronimo and his band surrendered to him, and on September 8th they left Fort Bowie for Fort Marion, Florida. The point of surrender to Miles was at Skeleton Canyon in Mexico, about 65 miles south of Fort Bowie. The surrender of Geronimo may be fixed as the date of the termination of the many years of warfare between the whites and the Apaches as a tribe, a warfare marked with a cruelty on the part of the Apaches probably unparalleled in the history of the 400 years of strife between the whites on the one side and the red man on the other. End of section 5「Section six of the Dread Apache, that early day scourge of the Southwest by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apache Kid begins bloody career through killing of sheriff and deputy and escape of Kid. Apache Kid begins bloody career. I have said that the surrender of Geronimo terminated the many years of bloody warfare with the Apaches as a tribe, but the Indian tribes may, and do, have outlaws in their own tribe, outlaws for whom, as a tribe, they are in no way responsible, and for whose acts the individual and not the tribe should alone be held amenable. Even the white tribe is not altogether immune from this infliction. 
in this class, among others, was the Apache Kid, who, following the surrender of Geronimo, with a few lawless followers, made independent warfare on isolated, helpless settlers, leaving the footprints of his bloody work wherever he went. The Kid, sometimes called the Apache Kid, and at others simply Kid, was an Apache scout occupying the position of sergeant under Al Sieber, chief of scouts. On June 1, 1887, the kid shot Sieber on the San Carlos Reservation, wounding but not killing him, and this marks the beginning of Kid's series of bloody crimes. Immediately following the shooting of Sieber, Kid, his squaw, and 16 other Indians left the reservation. Captain Burgess, Old Time Scout An interesting old time scout is Captain John D. Burgess, who came to Arizona in 1873 to look after some mining interests for General Cotts and Colonel Biddle of the Army, subsequently becoming a guide and scout for the government, and in 1882 was chief of Indian police at San Carlos. At the time the kid started out on his career, Captain Burgess was working some mines of his own at Table Mountain in the Galura Mountains. The officer in command of the troops sent out from San Carlos in pursuit of the kid and his followers, knowing Burgess immediately secured his services as guide and trailer. Following the kid and his band, they trailed them through to Pontano, where they had crossed the railroad and going up Davidson's Canyon and passing E. L. Vale's ranch had accommodated themselves to a bunch of his horses. Passing down the east side of the Santa Rita's, they killed Mike Grace, an old miner near Old Camp Crittenden. Here Captain Lawton, with a troop of the 4th Cavalry, heading them off and forcing them to turn back, they passed by Mountain Springs, near the present Vale Station, and were run over the Rincon Mountains, where they were so closely pursued that while in camp they lost all the horses they had stolen. They now headed for the reservation, which they succeeded in reaching before Lieutenant Carter Johnson, who was immediately behind, could overtake them, and here they surrendered, and in due course were tried and sent first to San Diego Barracks, passing through Tucson on September 3rd, and subsequently, in February 1888, were transferred to Fort Alcatraz in the Bay of San Francisco. Subsequently, the United States Supreme Court, having decided that the trial of an Indian devolved on the county in which the crime was committed, ordered that all the Indians sentenced by other than the territorial courts should be returned to the territory and tried by such courts. Under this order, the kid and several others were returned and tried by Judge Kibbe at Globe, and on October 30, 1889, sentenced to imprisonment at Yuma, and were being taken there by Sheriff Reynolds and his deputy, Hunky Dory Holmes, they were being conveyed by stage over the Pinal Mountains via Riverside and Florence. In the stage were Reynolds, Holmes, a Mexican, who was also being taken to Yuma, the kid and seven other Indians, and Eugene Middleton, the driver of the stage, making twelve in all. Killing of Sheriff and Deputy and Escape of Kid The Indians were handcuffed together, two and two, and had shackles on their ankles. They stopped overnight at Riverside, about halfway between Globe and Florence. Leaving Riverside early on the morning of November 2nd, while passing up a heavy sand wash, the pooling being quite heavy, in order to relieve the team, the two officers and six of the Indians got out to walk, the Indians probably having had their shackles loosened from at least one ankle to enable them to do so. The kid and one of the Indians still remaining in the stage. Suddenly, the six Indians that were walking seized the two officers, whom they overpowered and killed with their own guns. As soon as Middleton discovered what was taking place, 
drawing his own revolver and covering the kid and the other Indian still in the stage, he kept him quiet until, on standing up to look back, he was shot through the face by one of the other Indians. In the meantime, the Mexican, taking advantage of the opportunity, escaped. Middleton, although badly wounded, was not killed. The Indians, however, evidently thought he was dead. He was, however, sufficiently conscious to realize what was taking place and avoided disabusing their minds of their belief, and in due course was rescued and taken to Globe, where he finally fully recovered. The eight Indians, now armed with a shotgun, a Winchester rifle, and three revolvers, partly stripping Middleton and the two officers, hastened to get away. Stories of the manner of their relieving themselves of their shackles do not agree. One story is that, finding a blacksmith shop near the mouth of the San Pedro River, they succeeded in cutting the shackles loose. Middleton's statement is that, finding the keys in the pockets of the sheriff, they easily freed themselves of their irons, and the plausibility of this is quite evident, as the officers must necessarily have had the keys with them. After their escape, the Indians are supposed to have come along the west side of the Catalina Mountains and passed near the halfway house between Tucson and Fort Lowell, as their tracks were seen there crossing the road going south. End of section 6「Section 7 of the Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest, by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sword presented to General Miles through What Would You Do? Sword presented to General Miles. The people of Arizona, having been finally and, it was felt, permanently relieved of this black incubus that had been hanging over them for the many years dating back to their early coming to the territory, and General Miles, having contributed so largely to the result, decided to do something marking their appreciation of the services rendered them, and this found expression in the presentation of a sword. Through a popular subscription, a magnificent sword costing $1,000 was procured through Tiffany and Company of New York, the blade being of the finest steel, beautifully etched, and the hilt of solid gold. The presentation took place on November 8, 1887, at Levens Park, at the foot of Pennington Street. It was originally intended that the ceremony should take place on September 4th, the anniversary of the surrender of Geronimo, but that day, falling on a Sunday, it was fixed for Monday the 5th. General Miles, however, having been injured by the overturning of the carriage in which he was out riding at Santa Monica, California, on August 8th, the presentation was delayed until the date named. Many notables in our country, also the governors of neighboring Mexican states, were invited to be present. A distinguishing feature in the very long procession leading to the park was 300 mounted papagos under their chief, Asuncion Rus, in all their barbaric splendor of feathers and paint. The papagos had always been the consistent friends of the whites and the inveterate foes of the Apaches, so they were more than glad to participate in this event. In addition to the conventional combination usually found in parades, there were the 4th U.S. Cavalry Band and a platoon of United States artillery, William Zeckendorf, one of the very early pioneers, acting as Grand Marshal. One of the photographs suggesting this article is of this procession, evidently taken from the roof of one of the buildings on the west side of Main Street, looking up Pennington Street, and shows the parade the full length of the street, the head not having quite reached Main Street. The presentation was made on a platform erected for the purpose in the park. Royal A. Johnson was president of the day, I having the honor of acting as secretary and Judge W. H. Barnes making the presentation address. One of my duties as secretary was to read the letters of regret 
from those who had been invited but were unable to be present. Among these I now recall letters from Secretary of War William C. Endicott, General Sherman, and R. G. Ingersoll. Among those present were Major Chaffee, subsequently Lieutenant General, and Lieutenant Wood, now Major General. The other of the two photographs is of General Miles, and those on the platform with him, taken as the general was delivering his address accepting the sword. In the evening, following the presentation, there was a reception and ball at the San Xavier Hotel. Since burned down near the station, this hotel at the time was kept by Wheeler and Perry. Johnny Greenleaf Mistakes Scouts for Kid As illustrating the trying experiences that one might be subject to during these troublous times when the fear of the kid was in the very air, I may relate one of a friend of mine, Johnny Greenleaf. Johnny was sinking a well on his ranch, some distance from the house, and had just ridden to where his two men were at work, one in the well and the other on top. Suddenly a number of Indians came in sight, approaching the well. Recognizing them as Apaches, he naturally assumed them to be the kid and some of his followers, and obeying the instinct of human nature, that of self-preservation, cried out, "'Here comes the kid!' quickly mounted his horse and started to escape. He had gone but a short distance, however, till that chivalrous spirit which makes one sacrifice his own life rather than cowardly desert his comrade asserted itself, and he immediately turned and rode back to his men, both of whom were now on top, realizing at the same time that there was absolutely nothing he could do, neither he nor his men having a shooting iron of any kind, all of their weapons having been left at the house. The Indians now approaching the well, Johnny asked them in English what they were hunting and where they were going. One of them, speaking English very poorly, in trying to make himself understood, mentioned the kid in such a way that Johnny understood him to say that he was the Apache kid. This simply confirmed what Johnny had thought, but it so startled him that for a while he could barely speak, for if this were the kid... There was little chance for their lives of either Johnny or his men. Finally recovering his nerve and asking something else, the Indian succeeded in making it understood that they were scouts from San Carlos and were seeking the kid. You can well imagine the relief of the three men when they realized that they were in no danger. What would you do? I think I hear one of my readers saying that Johnny's attempt to escape was a cowardly thing to do. Yes? What would you have done? And what would I, under the same circumstances? Unless idiotic, or too frightened to mount the horse, we would have done just what Johnny did. Assuming that this had been the kid, as Johnny firmly believed, his escape meant the loss of but two lives, instead of the loss of the same two and the sacrifice of a third, his own, if he remained. But no man knows just exactly what he would do under a certain trying condition until he has been subjected to the test of that very condition. He may think he does, but he doesn't. But having gone less than one hundred yards, Johnny's mind has had time to react, and the chivalrous spirit asserts itself, and he turns and rides back. To what? To his death, he has every reason to believe. But having gotten the one hundred yards away, would you or I have turned and ridden back to our own certain death? Is there not a possibility that were the world wide enough and the horse strong enough, we might still be going? In your imagination, don't place the standard too high for the nerve you think you possess, if at the time you are absolutely in no danger. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Dread Apache, That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stoicism of Indian through Clark Vow's Vengeance 
Stoicism of Indian The following incident shows something of the character of these Ishmaelites of the desert. On one occasion, five of them had been tried at Florence for the killing of someone in the Superstition Mountains and sentenced to be hanged. The night previous to the day of the hanging, while in their cells, with the death watch outside, three of them, to avoid the ignominy of death by hanging, committed suicide by self-strangulation. This they could do only by each putting a cord around his neck and deliberately choking himself to death. The three were found dead in the morning when the guards entered their cells. Of course it is not possible to recall the names of all of the many whose lives were sacrificed to the safety and prosperity of the great commonwealth that was to follow, but I have in mind that on June 7, 1886, Thomas Hunt, a prospector, was killed near Harshaw, and on June 9 of the same year, Henry Baston was killed near Arvica. On September 22, 1888, W. B. Horton, post trader at San Carlos, was killed by one of the Indians on the reservation. But in this case, punishment was swift as the Indian police almost immediately killed the murderer while he was attempting to escape from the reservation. Wallapai, Clark, and the Kid One of our early frontier characters was E. A. Clark, familiarly known as Wallapai, having gained the title years ago when in the government service as chief of the Hulapai Scouts. Clark was a giant in stature, measuring six feet three, absolutely fearless and in those olden times equally tireless. Coming to the territory in 69, his life and experiences here would fill a volume of intensely interesting reading, but in this limited article I can mention only a few of his closing Indian experiences. The culminating one, the one of the greatest service to the territory, resulting in the death of that outlaw and terror of the border, this same Apache kid. Clark's first experience with the kid was on June 3, 1887, two days after his shooting of Al Cyber. At the time, Clark was living at his ranch, the Oak Grove, in the Galayura Mountains, about 12 miles east of the San Pedro River, but was absent his two partners, John Scanlan and William Deal, being at home. The kid and his followers, coming across the country from San Carlos, stole 15 horses from William Atchley, then came on to Clark's place three miles further on. At the time, Deal was about 150 yards from the house, cutting some poles for a corral, when Scanlan, who was in the house, heard three shots, and seizing his gun, ran out, and as he did so, saw three Indians coming towards the house, and firing at them, they immediately sought shelter. When Scanlan fired at the Indians, one of them lost a big sombrero, which he was wearing, and which, probably very much to his regret, he was unable to recover. Then they rounded up a number of Scanlan's horses not far away, and seemingly tried to get Scanlan to come out to protect his horses, and thus enable them to get a shot at him. But being unable to do this, they left, taking the horses with them. As soon as they had gone, Scanlan went to where Deal was, and found him dead, the Indians having shot him. Clark Vows Vengeance Clark, returning home a day or two later and finding his partner dead, vowed vengeance on the kid, and this, several years later, he found opportunity to gratify. A few months later, Clark and Scanlon, having occasion to be away, left a young engineer, J. A. Mercer, at the house with a caution to be on the lookout for the Indians. Soon after, Mercer discovered three of them crawling up towards the house, but was in time to seize a rifle and fire at them, and as he did so, they broke and ran. However, they took five of Clark's horses in exchange for three of their own, which they killed before leaving. 
For several years, Clark impatiently bided his time. To him, the mills of the gods were, indeed, grinding slowly, but they were grinding, and the time was approaching when the grist should be delivered. In the meantime, the kid was continuing to lengthen his trail of blood. Now here, now there, the wily outlaw was ever at his work. A murder here today, he is heard of one hundred miles away tomorrow, leaving a trail behind him marked by where he had changed his mount by the stealing of a new one at some ranch, leaving his old one dead in exchange. This was his practice, killing the animal he might leave by stabbing in the side, thus avoiding the sacrifice of any of his ammunition, which he could ill afford to lose. Being an outlaw with his own people, he found it difficult to replenish his belt. End of section 8「Section Nine of the Dread Apache: That Early Day Scourge of the Southwest by Dr. Merle Pingree Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Kid Near's End of His Trail of Blood Through Kid's Career Ended. Kid Near's End of His Trail of Blood. But at last, the end of his career of robbery and bloodshed is approaching. The opportunity that Clark has been waiting all these years is nigh at hand. The Apache kid's race is about run. Clark had been away from home, and when returning, on February 4, 1894, passing by the house of Emerson, a neighbor, about a mile from his own home, he noticed the tracks of three Indians about the house, and going inside found that they had robbed it of its contents. Going on home, he found his partner, Scanlon, whom the Indians had not disturbed, and said to him, Scanlon, your old friend the kid has been around again. Soon after, Clark, taking his gun, went out of the house for the purpose of scouting the country around and seeing whether he might get sight of the Indians. Going to the top of the peak nearby, where he could overlook the surrounding country without unduly exposing himself, he awaited events, not realizing what an approaching one should mean to himself and to an old enemy on whom he had vowed vengeance for the death of his old-time partner, and that this event would mark an era in a life ever filled with its dangers, not one of which had ever been shirked, but always bravely met. The opportunity for which he had waited and in his way, a way probably familiar only to the old scout, had prayed for, was but a few short hours away. The language of his prayers, except for its fervency, may not have been up to the orthodox standard, but he knew what he wanted, and in asking for it, used the language with which he was familiar, the language of the desert and the mountain, the campfire and the trail. Closing Act in Great Drama Clark had been there for probably twenty minutes when, looking off across an intervening canyon, he noticed three Indians approaching his horse where it was grazing, about 1,500 yards away. The Indians, not having discovered Clark, who, knowing it would be impossible to get across the canyon in time to save his horse, raised the sights of his gun and fired at them, not expecting, however, to hit any one of them at that distance, but hoping to frighten them away from his horse. On firing, Clark immediately ducked into the canyon, out of sight of the Indians, who were evidently frightened by the shot. Waiting there until dusk, he cautiously crawled towards his horse for the purpose of taking him to the house, and was within about seventy-five yards of him, it being too dark to see an object distinctly at any distance, when he saw two Indians approaching the horse, and only a few steps from the animal, and about fifty yards from where Clark was. Owing to the darkness, it was impossible to more than distinguish the two Indians, who were but a few feet apart, one ahead of the other. These were subsequently found to be the kid and his squaw, the squaw in front and nearest to Clark, 
but owing to the darkness it was impossible to distinguish one from the other clark instantly raised his gun and fired at the one nearest to him but being unable to see the sights could only take a quick aim along the barrel by his long experience with a gun he knew the danger of overshooting in the dark and made allowance accordingly as clark fired there came a simultaneous report from the kid's rifle and an outcry from the squaw and from the character of this outcry clark knew that he had made the mistake of firing at the wrong indian the ball from the kid's gun whistled alarmingly close to clark's head but fortunately did no harm following the shots the two indians immediately dropped to the ground and as fast as the old scout could work his rifle he pumped the lead into where he had dropped firing several shots the indian however fired but the one shot clark then made a run for his horse but the animal being frightened he was unable to catch him not knowing how many of the indians there might be about clark immediately set out for mammoth on the san pedro where he procured a small posse and was back at the scene of the shooting by morning finding the squaw dead a short distance from where she had been shot following the kid's trail they found that he had hopped on one foot to where he had left his horse one of his legs evidently being broken scouts from san carlos following his trail found some bloody rags where he had built a little fire and probably dressed his wounds kid's career ended thus ended the murderous career of the kid the terror of the southwest clark had undoubtedly hit him with one or more of his shots where or how soon after he may have died no white man knows clark being the last one to see him as the two shots simultaneously rang out on the silence of that night had it been the kid instead of the squaw clark would have earned the large reward that was offered for him dead or alive tom horn an old scout who spoke the apache language like a native came from denver subsequently hoping that by some chance the kid might still be living somewhere and that he might earn the reward the mother and the sister however both assured him that the kid was dead but beyond this would say nothing it would seem that there could be no more fitting ending to this little sketch than its dedication to the memory of those old timers makers of early day history the old pioneers each well played his individual part in that great border drama on them the curtain has rung down for the last time to them the succeeding generations owe much end of section nine end of the dread apache that early day scourge of the southwest by dr merle pingree freeman read by laurie banza